Hello, uh, good morning, and as David Frost used to say, uh, welcome to Gough Square Live. My, my name is uh, Alex Greenwood, Alexander Greenwood. Uh, I'm a barrister, I'm a door tenant at Gough Square Chambers. I practice in consumer and trading standards law in particular. Uh, I prosecute regularly on behalf of local authorities, but lots of other regulatory bodies. Uh, the aim of the talk today, which will last about 20 minutes, uh, it's called uh, Fabulous Fraudulent trading uh, and the object of the exercise is to discuss uh, what fraudulent trading is, when to charge it, uh, how to use it, how useful it can be uh, and why I'm here to try and persuade you it, it can answer many of the very difficult questions that we sometimes face uh, when considering what charges to levy. So when to use fraudulent trading? Uh, when does it apply? When would it be more helpful than perhaps substantive fraud act offences or uh, other CPR offences and the like. Well, it, it's a charge which assists in relation to cases with multiple complainants, for example, a systemic offending where a defendant is carrying out the same sort of uh, MO, modus operandi, way of doing the crime uh, again and again. Uh, offences committed over a significant period of time where individual counts and charges just wouldn't do justice uh, to the length of time that the offences were ongoing. Uh, multiple charges often overload an indictment. Uh, those of us who attend the Crown Court often hear complaints from judges, well, uh, why do you have 20, 30, sometimes 40 or even 50 charges on an indictment? That can only make it difficult, uh, not only for the judge, but also importantly uh, for the jury. Uh, multiple defendants, where lots of defendants are involved in something which is clearly part and parcel of the same uh, entity, the same way of doing the commit, the offence, uh, the same uh, business, if you like. Uh, the use or the misuse of companies hiding behind the corporate veil. All of these are uh, the types of offences where fraudulent trading uh, would have application. But there are other charges, of course, you can use. Uh, conspiracy to defraud is a classic, but that requires the actual defrauding uh, of individuals. Uh, conspiracy uh, of specific offences, trademark offences, for example, uh, can apply. But that can be difficult to prove in terms of the elements of the offence. Uh, and uh, conspiracy, of course, requires uh, two or more defendants. The beauty of fraudulent trading is it can have as much application to multiple defendants uh, as it can for the sole trader. So when to consider charging? Well, the Crown Prosecution Service charging guidance uh, says as follows, uh, participation by a sole trader in fraudulent business, section nine of the Fraud Act, of course, the fabulous Fraud Act. Section nine makes it an offence for a person knowingly to be a party to the carrying on of a fraudulent business where the business is not carried on by a company. The offence parallels the offence of fraudulent trading in section 993 of the Companies Act. That's really important uh, for you as practitioners, uh, lawyers perhaps, or uh, officers, considering what charges should be levied against defendants. Bear in mind, if there are companies involved, uh, then often it is section 993 of the Companies Act that would apply. But if they're a sole trader or there's no corporate entity, uh, then uh, the Fraud Act would have greater application. Non-corporate traders covered by the new offence include sole traders, but partnerships, trusts and companies registered overseas. Uh, all of that uh, is contained within the Crown Prosecution Service's own guidance. Uh, how can a defendant commit an offence? Well, uh, the offence is committed uh, either by knowingly being a party to the carrying out of a company's business uh, with intent to defraud creditors uh, of any person, or, uh, and this is the crucial point, for any other fraudulent purpose. So there are two ways of carrying out the offence, either defrauding creditors or uh, what you may think is a very broad term for any other fraudulent purpose. And that, you might think, 
is what makes this charge or these charges, either under the Companies Act or under the Fraud Act, so effective. Fraudulent purpose is as broad as the nature of criminality that you're investigating. Now, I've said that there are two ways of committing the offence. It's important to look at them. Section 993 of the Companies Act really predates the Fraud Act. It goes back, in fact, uh, over 100 years and originates from insolvency proceedings. Uh, it, the case law in relation to it uh, broadly relates to defrauding creditors. But importantly, in 2006, uh, the statute contains that crucial other phrase, or for any fraudulent purpose. And it's that that this talk will be focusing on, because that is the elastic phrase that may well cover any number of criminal activities. So section 993 relates to a business or a company carried out with intent to defraud or for any other fraudulent purpose. To prove the charge, every person who is knowingly a party to the carrying on of the business commits an offence. Uh, the advantage, it doesn't deal or speak of directors or managers. Every person knowingly a party to the carrying on of the business in that manner commits an offence. So when you're looking at a company, don't concern yourself just with the directors and the upper echelons. Uh, how broad is the involvement of the prospective defendants? Because under Section 993, uh, it, it will include all individuals involved in the company, uh, whether they are an officer, director or not. Compare and contrast. The Fraud Act 2006, same year, uh, legislators clearly had exactly the same thing in mind because the wording is, is almost identical. The person is guilty of an offence if he's knowingly a party to the carrying on of a business to which this section applies. This section applies to a business which is carried on by a person outside the reach of Section 993 of the Companies Act 2006 and with intent to defraud creditors uh, of any person or for any other fraudulent purpose. We see it again. So what did that mean? Well, for a long time, there was confusion about the parameters of this charge. Did you have to have a victim, for example? Uh, did you need uh, deception? The case of the Crown and Hunter, uh, 2021, EWCA CRIM 1785, uh, gave us guidance uh, as to the scope of fraudulent purpose and fraudulent trading. It, it was a case involving secondary ticket sales. Uh, a company had been set up uh, which had bots uh, buying tickets on bulk uh, from the suppliers online. It's probably the reason that you or I uh, can never get tickets to our favourite band or, or artist. Uh, and so uh, Hunter and others uh, were involved in buying tickets falsely representing to the source seller that they were buying as individual customers. Uh, they were selling the tickets, but as part of the conditions of sale, uh, resales such as that being conducted by the defendants in this case, uh, potentially uh, allowed the tickets to be voided. There was therefore a risk of, of cancellation. One of the interesting things about the case is there didn't seem to be any specific victims, any complainants who said their tickets hadn't been honoured. Uh, that was considered by the Court of Appeal. Lady Justice McCure uh, was considering all the assorted elements of the offence of fraudulent trading. She said this, the phrase to defraud creditors of any person covers the situation where creditors are creditors of the business but the business is not a legal person. The creditors could be creditors of individuals or other related companies. But then went on to say about the term fraudulent purpose, that it connote, connoted or connotes an, an intention to go beyond the bounds of what ordinary decent people engaged in business would regard as honest. She was citing the case of the Crown and Grantham. You've got the citation on the slides. I shan't read those out. Or traditionally, 
fraudulent purpose included uh, the involving, according to the current notions of fair trading, among commercial men, real moral blame. Now, those of you considering those phrases or who did so prior to the case of Hunter may have struggled. What on earth do they mean? But the beauty about this case is it analysed what was meant by the offence of fraudulent trading and fraudulent purpose. It said this, the cumulative ingredients of the offence are threefold. One, that any business is being carried on. Well, uh, those of you who are sharp-eared and eagle-eyed will have seen that, of course, as part of the offence. For a fraudulent purpose, you may think that's obvious. And then finally, that the defendant is knowingly party to the carrying on for the fraudulent purpose. And like in respect of the first limb offence, uh, that being in relation to creditors, there is no reference to an intention to deceive in the second limb offence. So a clear distinction is being drawn between the two ways the charge can be put, one in relation to creditors and the other in relation to fraudulent purpose. And in relation to fraudulent purpose, the Court of Appeal has said there is no need to have an intention to deceive. So what about that second component for any fraudulent purpose? Well, the court said there'll be rarely a dispute about purpose. What is it that the business was setting out to do in this case to purchase tickets using bots and sell them on? Uh, the real issue was whether the acts taken by the appellants with this purpose in mind were fraudulent. And we start, the Court of Appeal said, with the law on this concept. The concept of fraud is well established. Dishonesty is an essential ingredient. One classic formulation is found in the case of Reed, Patrick and Lyon. And you have the citation where Judge Morn uh, said it involved, according to the current notions of fair trading amongst commercial men, real moral blame. So citing that test to which we've already referred. The running of a business in a fraudulent manner will commonly involve acts of commission and omission. The deliberate concealment or suppression of true facts or information might be compelling evidence of fraud. Commissions and omissions can be two sides of the same dishonest coin. Importantly, the court said a fraudulent purpose might be proven before anyone is actually defrauded or becomes an actual victim of a fraud. The third component is that the defendant is knowingly party to that carrying on for a fraudulent purpose, mimicking the wording of the Companies Act, as we've already discussed. In conclusion, there must be or must there be an intention to deceive? Well, the court said there is no requirement for the prosecution to prove an intention to deceive. In very many cases, that is likely to be a key ingredient in the evidence, which goes to prove fraudulent purpose. But it isn't strictly necessary. And that's important to us as practitioners applying fraudulent trading to the offences we deal with. Interestingly, in the Hunter case, uh, they were CPR offences, consumer protection from unfair trading charges, uh, in essence, but with the element of dishonesty. Uh, and what the Court of Appeal, of course, observed was that these were misleading acts or omissions, the onward sale where the purchaser didn't know that there was a risk that the tickets that they were buying might not be valid at all. Potentially no victim, but the risk of loss alone was sufficient. The Court of Appeal said this, uh, in conclusion, in relation to harm or prejudice, the court rejected the argument that was put forward by the defence that the prosecution had to prove injury to a narrow proprietary interest. It is the purpose, the court said, that matters, not the actuality, not what actually happened. What was the purpose? And of course, that is the wording of the two acts which, are, which we're considering. On the facts of the present case, the judge and the jury clearly concluded there was real prejudice to the rights and interests of third parties, buying as they were tickets which could have been invalid or invalidated. 
The judge explained to the jury fraud meant having as a purpose acting to the prejudice of the rights of another person or exposing that person to the risk of their economic interests being prejudiced, buying the ticket, the ticket not being valid. The acid test, the court said, for fraud is dishonesty. There was no requirement for the prosecution to prove the rights or interests of the third party were harmed. It was possible to identify a variant of the facts of this case where defendants, for example, used duplicitous deceptive conduct, which might amount to a breach of contract or breach of statutory duty. Persuade counterparties to act in a way that they would not act if they were informed of the truth and thereby make significant profits that would not otherwise have made, they would not otherwise have made had they acted in a candid, frank and lawful manner. So what is the criminality and how to charge it? Well, often participating in a fraudulent business won't just be a standalone charge. It, it can often uh, reflect, for example, lesser offences, substantive offences are on the same charge sheet. Uh, in this instance, tobacco products, for example. So it's a simple charge, setting out the defendant's name, setting out the dates, uh, setting out uh, the fact that uh, an individual was involved in the sale of unlawful tobacco. What's the difference between a substantive offence and the fraudulent business offence? Well, you'd expect system, but then if it's come to the attention of the local authority, the likelihood is you have plenty of evidence that the offending is systemic, uh, but also that crucial element of dishonesty. So the defendant who's previously been warned, for example, and made aware that the sale of tobacco is unlawful, or, or indeed uh, the um, defendant uh, who in the modern world is purchasing uh, untaxed tobacco overseas or counterfeit tobacco uh, and they are aware of it because for example the amount that they purchase the item for is so far below the retail price evidence of dishonesty can be crucial is crucial to justify a charge of fraudulent trading over and above substantive offenses which can be included on the indictment and of course uh, we know that sometimes defendants do plead to substantive offences when they are concerned uh, that uh, they may be convicted of a fraud charge with the significantly greater sentencing powers that applies. So how to put your case in a fraudulent trading charge? Well, what's crucial is the written opening. Uh, young lawyers sometimes get confused about this uh, and worry, but a written opening in bookend offences that is charges over a long period of time can be crucial in setting out the nature of the criminality, what it is you, you say the defendant has done uh, and how they've done it uh, and over the period that they have committed the offence. So a written opening, prosecution opening from the outset uh, is a, an important component part when you're charging this offence. What application does fraudulent trading have? Well, it, it has very broad application to the work of local authorities. For example, trademark offences, where a defendant has previously been convicted or been warned or cautioned or put on notice or entered into an agreement under the Enterprise Act, for example, and knows that what they are doing is unlawful. They are circumventing the law. They are acting dishonestly. Illegal dog breeding. I, I have cases at the moment where former license holders have deliberately decided to carry on selling their animals and breeding their animals, knowing full well that they required a license to do that. Prosecution say in those circumstances uh, they knew they should have a license and be subjected to the inspection regime to ensure animal welfare. Uh, and so they are behaving dishonestly. And so fraudulent trading is an appropriate charge, potentially, in those circumstances. Legal tobacco sales, we've already covered. But doorstep crime, rogue builders. One of the first cases I ever did involving Section 9 of the Fraud Act was a rogue builder who had over 40 complainants, all coming forward 
saying that he'd taken the money, done a couple of days' work, and then disappeared, uh, pocketing the cash. Uh, I'd anticipated uh, that we would have over 40 separate charges, but a single charge sufficed, and a guilty plea was forthcoming. And because the prosecution had set out how they put their case, including all the different defendants, uh, that gave the judge sufficient sentencing powers. And it's important because fraudulent trading uh, uses the guidelines set out by the Sentencing Council that apply to fraudulent representations, where, of course, the value of the fraud, and that's where the prosecution opening has such uh, importance, uh, is reflected in the penalty that is ultimately imposed uh, and also, of course, has important implications for proceeds of crime uh, when confiscation arises at the end of the case. So I hope that's been of some assistance. It's a bit of a whistle top stop tour uh, through uh, fraudulent trading, but it really is a crucial and very useful tool in the armory of prosecuting authorities uh, when considering uh, offences where uh, there may be many small offences, but it is obvious that an individual or company uh, was behaving dishonestly uh, and the practices were such uh, that justify the charge. Uh, if you have any questions or issues arising, please feel free to email me. My uh, email is alex.greenwood at goffsquare.co.uk. I'm happy to uh, answer any queries, no strings attached, as it were. Um, but thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to talking to you again uh, on uh, Goff Square Live. Thank you.